You're about to listen to Free Talk Live's Weekly Digest, some of the best segments from last week's Free Talk Live, as collected by super activist Benjamin Bartholomew. Don't forget, you can listen to every hour of Free Talk Live by going to freetalklive.com. Ben is with us in Livingston, West Virginia. Hey, Ben, you're on the air. Well, I was actually in Livingston, Virginia, headed to Lynchburg, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. All right. But I am a former Virginia State Trooper. And, uh, you know, my position on these stops and traffic checks, I've often tried to contrast that because I got out of law enforcement business about 25 years ago. Oh, wow. But, you know, the whole deal, the whole deal that, that bothers me the most, looking back on my track record, this business of pulling people over and, and radioing in and I'm checking out a subject. You ever heard, have you ever been around law enforcement and said I'm, I'm, I'll get a 1029 on a subject? Yep. You know, uh, England has subjects. United States of America has citizens, mm. and as a citizen, I don't like being, I didn't like it then, uh, and I don't know how we came, came to this, because I don't, well, I don't appreciate traffic stops either, I, I mean, I, I've been out of business long enough to where, uh, I'm a very private person, I don't want, I don't want my business broadcast all over everything, and the truth of the matter is, we are coming to a state that there will be no secrets, you will not be safe, it, 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 and this whole deal with them building up military arsenals, and it's coming. It is coming. I feel it in my bones. Now, Ben, you said you've been out of the policing world for 25 years. That's a pretty long time, uh, you know, to be out. So what have you seen change, at least from the outside or maybe some from some people that you still know who are kind of on the inside? What are some of the observations that uh, that you've made about policing since you left it? Well, when I was in law enforcement, you know, the only people that really carried guns were the police. You know, we we didn't really have. Well, well you were just talking about it with you know these government agencies having guns and stockpiles of weapons. They didn't have it. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, you know, having resource officers at school. I've never understood why we did that because when I was going to school, the two kids got into a fight. You know, you settle it in the schoolyard and it'd be done. Now, you know, if two kids get into a fight, somebody is going to get a criminal record as a result of that. Mm -hmm. It is just beyond where I think it needs to be. I think this is uh, good stuff. If you have more you want to share, uh, Ben, you're welcome to hang through the news. If you got to go, I understand, and I appreciate hearing from you tonight. Hang on otherwise. The toll-free number is 855-453. Former state trooper in uh, the state of Virginia 25 years ago. It's interesting to get the perspective. We actually uh, ended the last hour with Ben in uh, West Virginia calling us. He's a former Virginia State Trooper, has been retired uh, for 25 years, and that's a pretty long time to be sitting back and watching your old uh, career, You know, watching the, the business of law enforcement, so to speak, and watch it develop over time. And in a way that doesn't sound like it was too satisfying to Ben, you're saying that uh, things are getting pretty out of control these days, Ben, and uh, you know, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but uh, I appreciate your calling and hanging on through the news there. Go ahead with uh, any other observations you want to share. Well, they are getting out of control, but I'll go back to things that were in control when I was in that, in that line of work, work. You're talking about these traffic stops. You know, If I'm following you uh, in my cruiser and I see you swerve or I observe a, uh, a taillight broken, I pull you over. That's called probable cause. I can pull you over, and then whatever happens after that, you know, it's perfectly actionable. These these checkpoints, there is no probable cause in that transaction. You you, you just stop because you have to. Mm-hmm. It has always been my belief any charge garnered as a result of a checkpoint like that with no probable cause is inadmissible in court. And I don't think mm-hmm. anybody's ever really challenged that. Well, Wouldn't I, surprise me. I'd love to. I'd love to hear a challenge because these uh, these checkpoints go on um, all over the United States. So I'd I'd love to hear people challenge it. But I've always kind of found the, uh, the the probable cause for a pullover to be weak sauce. We had a guy call in tonight who said that he got uh, pulled over because he had a tail uh, had his tag light out, and then he w- checked it. Uh, you know, about a quarter mile down the road. And the tag light wasn't out, and the police well, it was op- out when we pulled you over, right, buddy. <laughs> right. So I mean, you know, a lot of times uh, police officers can just say whatever they want to say in order to get the pullover, and that doesn't make for a very accountable organization. I have to agree with you, and believe it or not, uh, there are municipalities that are notorious for that. And you know, this whole deal of uh, of uh, racial profiling. It is going on, going on, going on, and it will continue to go on. 
And then at some level, I support it. And this is going to sound odd because, you know, typically if having done that line of work, you know, you know what these people look like, you know what they're doing, and it, it, it's just, it's just, it's hard to catch them. But when you do get them old, you get them pulled over, and you, it, it invariably turns up something. It, rarely are you going to pull them what over. About the and stop and frisks? What about the stop and frisks going on in New York City? I mean, you're having, uh, basically, it seems like they're just stopping young black males <laughs> and uh, shaking them down. Many times you're talking about people going to work, wearing ties and things like that. It's, it's not about dress. It seems to be entirely about race. Well, now that I don't understand. I mean, if I, if I see a man, black, white, Mexican, it don't matter. If he's wearing a tie and carrying a briefcase. Oh, to me, checking that fella gonna be slim to none. A guy with his britches down around his hind end, and you know. So you're not saying it's racial profiling so much as it is uh, class-based profiling. You're more likely to profile a uh, a poor-looking person or kind of a uh, you know a gangster-looking person than some. Yeah, more, more about the gangster. It's more about that gangster. Those are the type of people that are going to be involved in the drug trade. Those are the type of people that are going to be involved in in illegal uh, activities. That's, that's where the profiling comes in. Now, i got to say, I think you've been real straight with us so far, Ben, and I appreciate the uh, the call and your, your perspective tonight. But I'm curious, uh, how do you feel about the war on drugs after having, uh, you know, 25 years off from the job? Well, uh, to be honest with you, I think marijuana should be legalized. Uh, we've got too many people in there for something like that. Uh, as the drug gets harder, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Because uh, if you look at Switzerland and the, uh, Finland, I think it is, whichever one, anyway, it, it's all legal over there. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story, and I'll be as quick as I can. All right. When I was 16, my buddy and I were out squirrel hunting. We come walking across the pasture. He stopped and looked down between his feet. And he said, what does that look like to you? And I said, it looked like pony poop. He said, no, what does it really look like? And I said, he said, no, it looks like dried marijuana. So he scoops up this dried marijuana into a paper by plastic bags, took it to school the next day, and sold it as marijuana. <laughs> well, he did. And then, was and then, it and actually marijuana? It. It no, it was, it was pony poop. Oh, God. And the dude smoked it. And the next day, he comes up to the, where we were the following day, and I thought, you know, you're going to get whipped. He's on to you, man. He, he walked more. up and we said, man, that was some good stuff. But that ain't what he said. Is that a true story? <laughs> I have heard that other is a people. True story. <laughs> I can name names. <laughs> wow! All I've right. heard, I've heard the stories. Well, yeah. I mean, if 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 pot were legal, no one would ever want to buy a questionable product from a questionable dealer, right? <laughs> if you could just go to Walgreens and get your uh, your pot there, you'd be good to go. He would. He would add his license suspended, no doubt. <laughs> good stories tonight, Ben. Thanks for the call. I really appreciate hearing from you. It's a great uh, perspective there. Always interesting to talk to both current and former law enforcement. You know, um, speaking to Ben, I I get a little confused on the profiling thing. I uh, you know I honestly. I don't like the idea of terminology of profiling. I, it, it's, it's, I hate the idea that uh, they're just going to pick people out for the way they look. However, it, I mean, you know, if you, if you paint your car bowling ball and uh, put giant rims on it and uh, roll around with uh, highly tinted windows or whatever it is that one does, you're necessarily going to draw the attention of the, police right i mean like that there's no doubt you're going to do that and i think he's right that generally you probably have some luck um with uh, if you're if you're going fishing for drug dealers or criminals or whatever it is you're going fishing for you're gonna figure out where the fishing holes are and mm -hmm. it seems like a, the ob it, it it makes i don't know it just seems dumb you know if you don't want to get caught doing this stuff why in the world don't look the part would you droll around like that or have your pants around your butt or whatever it is that makes, you know, that makes police officers right. think? Because I'll tell you, when I get pulled over, I ne almost never get a ticket. It's because of the way I look and the way I yeah. dress and the kind of car I drive. Well, I mean, drug dealers have known this. Uh, smugglers have known this for a long time. I mean, that's why a smuggler who knows what they're doing is going to use gr a grandmotherly type or something like that. Or maybe Oftentimes, a, mom, a mom, yes. mom with a kid or the something. The smart ones, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, and if you want to know what ProXPN is, I'll just say this first. It's something you want, if you care about your privacy, of course. And in today's world, your online privacy is very much intertwined with your real meat space. 
privacy. Okay, so ProXPN is a VPN service. It's virtual private network. And what this does is it encrypts all of your data, all anything going up, all your metadata data going up online before it even gets to the ISP, before it gets to Comcast and Verizon and all those other companies. Uh, and it makes sure they can't see it before it gets to the NSA. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause this is all done. Cl- right. This is all done client side. Okay. On your machine, which is how you want it done. It uses open VPN. If you're curious, how can I trust pro XPN? Well, it uses open VPN, which is the software backend. Okay. That is really trusted by just about everybody. Uh, as far as the geeks go, as far as the security minded go. So yeah, it's open source. So the, ch- the code's been checked. Okay. Not that we're committing the open source fallacy. Right? No, 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 no. That's no. actually been checked. <laughs> yeah, that that's right. That's right. Because sometimes open source, like open SSL, is bad news. But that's all the more reason the internet is really in some degree of trouble right now. So getting a VPN is a great thing to have. Believe me. And this costs less than a cup of Starbucks coffee a month if you use the code FTL twenty. And this works for all your devices. And if you use the code FTL twenty, you're going to get twenty percent off the lifetime of your account. Or you, can you can also try it for free, right? You can try it for free at first, but believe me, you're going to want to get on it, okay? I mean, you know, a lot of people say that there's free uh, alternatives to VPNs. No, believe me, if you're using a VPN service, you want to be paying them to keep up to date with all these, you know, all these bugs we find out that happen on the Internet, all the nonsense going on with the NSA, because believe me, ProXPN will tell suits to take a hike, mm-hmm. and that is priceless, quite frankly, let alone forget five bucks a month if you go with, like, an annual plan or if you use Bitcoin. So I want you to check it out, proxpn.com, use code FTL20, and take control of your online privacy seriously. So in the beginning of the show, we got a spate of callers, which is great. We love taking your calls. But we started off the show talking about this article that was about the Free State Project, and it ran in Forbes. And I want to continue that conversation because we just had started to scratch the surface of uh, this coverage of the Free State Project. And I think we're kind of approaching it from, you know, we live here, we are, we, we moved to New Hampshire because of the Free State Project, so we know it very well. We've been in it for a long time. But uh, what does somebody who's a reporter have to say who's covering it kind of from the outside? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it is very interesting. And it's a phenomenon that most people don't even know is going on. Even in New Hampshire, they have no idea that this is happening. Yep. So 13 years later, um, there are over 2,000 free staters scattered around New Hampshire, and the petition is now 4,000 signatures short of triggering the full move. The concentration of free staters is highest in New Hampshire twice a year during the group's two annual gatherings, the uh, the Pork Fest, which is held in the woods in the summertime. Oh, and that's what she described as Bacchanalian. Right? That's right, Bacchanalian. <laughs> I just Has skipped. she been to Pork Fest? I didn't see Cashmere Hill at Pork M- Fest. Maybe, maybe she, that's just the description that mm. she heard. Anyway, <laughs> so it's held in the summertime, and it is, um, in fact, you know, a beautiful place up in uh, up in Lancaster, New Hampshire. It's coming up here in about... Next week. A week. Next Sunday, we will be doing the show from Porkfest. Indeed, and it, it's. Can you it, believe it? <laughs> it is. A, it is. It's a delightful event. Whether it's uh, you know, it's it's family, it's parties, it's whatever you want it to be. Lots of speeches going on. So anyway, the other event is an ac- more academic spirited, and it's a conference called the Liberty Forum. It's held a hotel in the winter time. And she says, I was invited to snowy New Hampshire this February to speak at the latter because free staters were interested in two things I write about: Bitcoin. And corporate privacy practices. I discovered that this isolated group has fully adopted Bitcoin and that it's extremely enthusiastic about um, other freedom enhancing technologies such as 3D printers and encryption. Now, I think that this is pretty accurate about uh, people here in New Hampshire. 3D printing still on the horizon, but Bitcoins. I can do business in Bitcoins. I get work on my farm done in Bitcoins. I buy things in Bitcoins. You can pretty much do anything but grocery shopping in Bitcoin these days if you go to a couple of sites like uh, eGifter.com or Gift.com. Yeah. Right. If you wanted to get groceries, I mean, Mark, should we say, I don't know if we should say this on the radio, but I purchased pigs from you Indeed. with Bitcoin. <laughs> yep, you did purchase Pork. some meat from me, um, and actually you purchased the animal, and then I um, handled the processing for you. But um, regardless of the, the legal minutia. <laughs> Beautiful bacon. Indeed. The best bacon I've ever had. And ever you got seen. it in uh, in Bitcoin. It Bitcoin. There's no doubt about it. So you can get food. It just, I don't think, gro- I haven't found the grocery store yet. I think that you can get Whole Foods gift cards through some online, um, you know, e-gifter things, but I'm not sure 
about anything else. Uh, it would be really nice if you could get, say, Publix cards or Kroger cards or, you know, up here it's Hannaford's and mm. um, Price Market Chopper. Market Basket. Yeah. Yeah. Market Basket's another one. So, anyway, going on. If anyone's listening who owns a grocery store, it'd be start really nice. Bitcoin. <laughs> Everyone I met at the project owned Bitcoin and I was, and was willing to accept it for goods and services. Of the couple thousand people living there, at least seven own 3D printers, though the idea originally was to get a critical mass to influence the political process. Many in the movement now feel that the pre- freedoms they want may be better realized through technology than, um, roots around the government rather than engaging in it directly. That is absolutely that true. That would be you, Stephanie. I-, I feel that way. Yeah. I mean, and not just with technology, but with relationships and kind of personal, you know, personal uh, network building. Um, but yeah, technology. Whoa, <laughs> technology is a huge part of it. Sorry, I have a drink with an ice cube in it, and the ice cube just basically exploded in my face. That's why I sounded so surprised. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I, I feel that way too. When I came here at first, I was interested in politics. I quickly realized that did was not going to work. Um, I think, it'll, I think we're having some success, but uh, I understand it, it didn't work for me. Very and, emotionally draining. Oh, I- incredibly. So at the very least, it didn't work for me. You know, I, I kind of I'm skeptical that it it will work in general. But um, that's kind of what inspired me to turn towards alternative types of solutions for getting more freedom in my life. And I've been happy with how those have worked out so far. So um, and I think that sentiment is very accurate. In fact, I had I have a good friend who moved to New Hampshire got really into the Bitcoin world and then realized, hey, I don't think I need to live in New Hampshire anymore. I'm going to go live near my kids instead because that will make me happy and I can be involved in Bitcoin from anywhere. Yeah. So it happens to people. Definitely they have this change in mindset. And, you know, if you can be free, if, if you feel like you can live freely anywhere, that's great. You know, go do that. The one thing that uh, when I have gone other places and looked at them for, you know, possible you know winter homes or something like that, what I find is is that I don't think that there's that freedom community. If you want to agree, go, if yep, you want to be near your not. your kids, that's there. I have no, um, I can't, I can't dispute that in any way, shape, or form. But uh, you know, like I, it's that conversation, being able to be around people that care about the ideas of liberty. Yep, definitely. Although, I mean, like I suppose, if you probably anywhere you live, you might be able to find at least a few friends or make a few friends around who are liberty minded, or at least receptive to the ideas of liberty i think that's pretty reasonable you know that you could find a a core group of friends wherever you are it's just in new hampshire you have a larger selection and a larger community to start out with because it's kind of the place for it yeah and and you really have people here with an added with with a certain attitude because they came here with this in mind they didn't just one day become you know anarchists or libertarians or whatever they said no this is what i am and i'm going to go do something about yeah, it yeah i'm going to put and, my and, money where my mouth is yeah and, and that's really live. different and i think that's pretty key i think that attitude is really key to what uh cashmere hill in forbes found here mm. in this article and it's really stunning for people that uh, that understand the ideas of liberty in some way shape or form when they come upon the liberty community in new hampshire because they they're like there are so many people that think like me <laughs> this has never happened to me before oh, yeah. because liberty people around america and probably around the world skulk in the uh, in the shadows and they're careful about what they say because they don't need just yet another conversation about how they're told that they hate poor people or whatever it is that uh, that the claim will be and here you can be accepted relatively quickly um if you uh you know, i mean there'll probably be people if you call ahead um and you know post something on one of the forums or whatever you'll have people there to unload your u-haul truck oh it's, yeah sometimes too many people so that they can like not everyone even right. has something to do someone shows up 20 minutes late and it's over because everybody's helped you that's move exactly in. what happened that happens it, took, a lot. it took eight hours for us to load our truck it took 20 minutes to unload it wow. that kind of thing well so. you know I'm sorry, I kind of forgot what I was about to say. No problem, let me go on. She says, here when I arrived at the airport, the organizers had arranged for me to be picked up by a Bitcoin-accepting driver in a winter-assaulted red Prius. I buckled up, but my driver, Riaz, simply ignored the car's annoying incessant beep that he put on his (laughs) seatbelt until it finally stopped. 
New Hampshire is the only state without a mandatory seatbelt law, and the free staters will do their best to keep it that way. <laughs> you know, Rick, can I, I want to comment on that, because I think a lot of people feel that that's not a big deal. It's like, oh, wow, you don't have to wear a seatbelt. But look, you know, wearing a seatbelt is, is a relatively new law in the order of laws in the United States of America. And it used to be a secondary offense if you weren't wearing one. That means when you got pulled over, you could not get pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt. In the past decade, it's become a primary offense in most other states. So yeah, what's it's the one or ticket if you right. It's one more reason that that you know police have a reason to pull you over in the in New Hampshire. Not so. Now, granted, they can they can make up whatever they want, right? Mm-hmm. But the point is, is that by law, this is one less reason for you to get pulled over, and I think that that's very important. It's not just you don't have to wear a seatbelt. Well, and the the rates, the truth is, is the rates of seatbelt wearage are the same in New Hampshire as they are in Vermont, Massachusetts, and Maine, which are the bordering states, which do have seatbelt laws. It's just that here, you can't be stopped and ticketed for it in in those places you can. So it's not actually saving any lives. It's not making a difference in the rates of seatbelt wearage to enforce it by law. It's It's making a a difference in revenue for the state. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why it won't go away for those places. Hopefully we won't get it. Now, Mark, let's continue with this article about the Free State Project that ran in Forbes. Uh, basically, a summary up to this point was uh, Kashmir Hill was describing her trip to the Liberty Forum here in New Hampshire. Right. She ran, rode in an agorist Bitcoin-driven taxi that was beaten up by the weather to the Liberty Forum and found a lot of people who were into 3D printing, into Bitcoin, uh, and into freeing themselves through the use of technology, which I thought was a cool observation because it certainly that's been consistent with uh, my experience and also the the shift in attitudes that I've seen some other people go through after they moved to New Hampshire themselves. It's going on here. She says the the driver of the car, Riaz, had moved from Orlando six months earlier, led to the movement through his support of the libertarian presidential candidate Ron Paul. It's amazing here, living with all these guys who, these people who hold the same beliefs as you, he says. We want to push back against bad laws, dec- decriminalize marijuana, push for more liberal gun and light knife laws, keep a ban on license plate readers. We want to eliminate regulations, taxes, and licenses. Within our community, a lot of us ignore that. And so we only work with other free staters. Well, not all free staters are flouting the law. If one is ignoring regulations and taxes, Bitcoin is a good currency to do it in, as there are no need to set up an account with a bank, which entails paperwork and financial monitoring. Eric Voorhees, a Bitcoin entrepreneur who recently made headlines for settling a suit with the SEC over selling shares in Bitcoin businesses for Bitcoin, moved this is really strange right like back when bitcoin wasn't a currency um he was selling uh, shares in a couple of businesses he had i bought them by the way both really? of them yeah. you were you were taken advantage of mark yes i was, I was. <laughs> good thing you had the government to fight for your rights right because otherwise these unscrupulous businessmen would just just exploit you right the government <laughs> fought for its right to get in between our relationship oh, and i wish yeah. they hadn't yeah. um <laughs> thank you i won't be needing your services <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much so he moved to new hampshire in may 2011 to join the free state project it was there that he first heard about bitcoin after someone posted about it and in, in the free state project facebook group very few free staters knew about it at that point they didn't like using government money but they were more into gold and silver than virtual currency I went, oh, and it's it's so funny to think about some of the commerce that went on in gold and silver back in the days before Bitcoin. It was just so clunky, like uh, trying to buy something with a round of silver, a one ounce round and make change for that. And how do you do that? And it was just a little bit awkward. Bitcoin really solved a problem in that respect. And of course, with silver, you have to carry it around and it sets off metal detectors and all that kind of stuff. Right? I, I like it and I keep it um, for, you know, in case for whatever reason, it, you, you know, I, I will pay anybody in, in silver. But the fact is, mm-hmm. is before when I was hiring people to do farm work, I'd offer them silver or dollars and they'd take dollars. Yeah. yeah. When Silver I, is for stacking, not for buying stuff with, really. I mean, <laughs> well, interestingly, <laughs> technology as well, uh, and actually it was solved by some liberty minded people, uh, solved kind of the, what you would call the clunkiness of silver was you had the silver app. Uh, that was made by by liberty minded people, and that actually would you know give you okay it would identify what the silver round was that you had in your hand it would give you the the value at that time uh, i mean and, and it really helped out with that issue, so technology even solved that That's as much true. as it could yep so going on uh, Eric Vore, he says, I went down the rabbit hole and i couldn 't stop talking about it. 
And when, he sure did. <laughs> and then uh, warmed other free staters up to it, too. Voorhees notes that Roger Veer, a Bitcoin entrepreneur who lives in Tokyo, also a signer of the Free State Project, he's a, he's a free stater. Friend uh, of the show. Also um, an early signer of the Free State p- Petition, and bought Bitcoins on ads um, for ads on Free Talk Live, a libertarian radio station <laughs> associated with the project. Sure, you could kind of call it a station, right? Uh, LRN.FM. Well, LRN. LRN. LRN.FM is a network, um, unless, but it broadcast on stations. It's a show. Rush Limbaugh has a show, and yeah. it's broadcast on stations. Free Talk Live is a show. It's yeah, he has the EIB network. That is fictitious. <laughs> what, is, what does that stand for? The Excellence in Broadcasting. Oh. Behind the golden microphone. And the, <laughs> and these are the things he says, but you know, what is the EIB network? It is Rush Limbaugh's show. Yeah. You know? <laughs> anyway, nine months after moving to New Hampshire, but th- this is one of the things here is this, so many people found out about Bitcoins through Free Talk Live. And Free Talk Live is, is closely associated, associated with the Free State Project. And I think that that... It's, it's interesting. Bitcoin, Free State Project, Free Talk Live, it's all kind of mixed up there. Nine months after moving to New Hampshire, Voyeur's moved to New York to go to work with BitInstant, an early Bitcoin exchange that is, that's since shut down. Its founder facing criminal charges, but other free staters took on the Bitcoin mantle. Zach and Josh Harvey moved to New Hampshire from Israel in 2011 to join the Free State Project, frustrated by the bureaucracy and regulation in Tel Aviv. They decided to start a Bitcoin ATM company called Lamassu. That's now sold hundreds of machines around the world. Mm. A Lamassu Bitcoin ATM was heavily used in the Liberty Forum, but no one has set one up permanently in New Hampshire yet, says Harvey. Well, that's because it's very difficult to uh, to be able to use one of these machines in the United States. Yeah, there's yeah, I, I have to say it's probably regulation. Yeah, it's all it's all regulation. Yeah, most people in the Free State Project are technologically oriented, and many come from a programming or computer background. The libertarian way of thinking is pretty common among techno technologists, says uh, Lamassu's Jack Har- you, Zach Harvey. You know, I think this is this is really true uh, because I think when you start getting into technology, you realize just how much you know how voluntarily we can interact with each other, and how technology can actually kind of enforce the the good the good contract or could enforce the. Uh, I don't know, what, what are the good practices, best practices on its own, and that you actually don't need government. Mm. If, if you have these things in place, now you don't want to replace it with tyranny of the code, right? But if you have these things in place and you're techno-minded yourself and so you can understand what's going on, you find out just how free everything really can be and how you know superfluous and redundant states are. Mm, there's a lot of talk about smart contracts lately, which are execute themselves. Dodd-Frank. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they're killing the mortgage industry. But the Mortgage Minute guy, Roger Schlesinger, has found some ways around these rules and organizations. Private loan sellers are competing directly against the U.S. government, and things look pretty good. Stated income loans are back. Um, So all you have to do is state your income, truthfully, of course, and they uh, will get you a loan. Rates are great. It's never been easier to get a loan. If you need to refinance or get cash out or buy a new home, whatever the reason is, call the Mortgage Minute guy. Maybe you've already, um, you're already working with somebody, and that's great, but you need a second opinion. Call the Mortgage Minute guy or go to MortgageMinuteGuy.com. The number is 866-288-0088. MortgageMinuteGuy.com, 866-288-0088. All right, let's uh, continue here. We've got Nathan on the line in Texas via Skype. And Nathan, you're on Free Talk Live with Ian, Derek, Jay, and Mark. Uh, hi, guys. Hi, hi. Derek, Jay. Hey. Um, so I thought I would apply the same methodology that I did in the jury nullification research to, to the uh, police lying thing. Because I thought, well, in jury nullification, I found lots of statements by courts that, oh, yeah, this is, this is okay. So I thought if I searched for cases where they said, oh, yes, lying to uh, suspects is okay, then that would work. And I found one case, and uh, it's called Fraser v. Cup. It's a 1969 case where the Supreme Court basically said that it was okay to lie to a suspect about evidence that uh, incriminated him. That's all it takes. There's more than that case. One Supreme Court ruling. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, it actually says the fact that the fact that the police misrepresented the statements that Rawls had made is, while relevant, insufficient in our view to make this otherwise voluntary confession inadmissible. Mm. Translation: They can lie. Yep. but I didn't really find any other information. I mean, I found a lot of just kind of Googling a little. I found information from lawyers, like people talking about how 
interrogation is really all about deception, whether it's emotional deception or um, hinting that you know more than you really know. Um, I couldn't really find any definite statement like, yes, uh, agents from the DEA are allowed to lie to you. Nothing really concrete like that. Well, if they're not prohibited from doing it, then they're allowed to do it, right? So uh, what's the crime? There is no crime. Well, because I was thinking of something like, someone gets a conviction like in this Frazier case and then they challenge it and then the court would say oh well you can't challenge this because xyz uh, it's more of a customary thing like i got i get i'm getting the impression that because of this Frazier ruling it set a kind of precedent where law enforcement can use deceptive tactics as long as they're not too deceptive apparently there they are can be very where- deceptive like what would be too deceptive in your mind uh, well, I, I, I didn't, I forget which one it was, but it was one where like they use threats and promises and, uh, basically if the conditions are become coercive enough, then, uh, then they're not allowed. Well, what's like, not coercive was, about threatening jail time? Well, right. But, uh, I was more interested in the, in the deceit aspect. You mean if they're but, like going to be, or you break your hand or something like that, like bash your face in, that would yeah, be yeah. maybe crossing a line. Yeah, well, right, but that. if that's the case, then they're not going to need to lie to you, right? They're just going to use brute force. No, no, they're just threats. lying about breaking your face. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Apparently, it's lying about – so apparently, just emotional – just lying about general things is fine. It's only – there. there is a case here where lying about evidence made it made them throw the conviction out, but I didn't write it down. But uh, it is possible for them to lie too much. But I guess the moral here is that they, they can lie about – evidence which convicts you so some of their nice. careers are based on uh lies like for instance today we were in court uh graham colson actually one of the activists in the Keene area had a case and we of course had to wait through every other case that was being called prior to graham because you whenever an activist comes up almost every time they want to clear the courtroom of all the regulars of all the average folks who are in there because they don't want them to see what happens during the activist trial and so one of the cases they were clearing out was a guy who was arrested on three counts of soliciting a prostitute. And this guy went on Craigslist. He posted an advertisement about how he wanted to hire someone to give him a BJ and that uh, he wanted to record that on video. Now, apparently, he was responded to on Craigslist by Officer, I think his first name is James, I could be wrong, but yep. McLaughlin. And he's an older man who works for the Keene Police Department, a detective with the Keene Police Department. He is basically their cyber crimes unit. And he makes a living off of pretending as though he is a young person online who is very, very horny and willing to do things, in this case, for money. Um, he's uh, He pretended to be a 20-year-old college student at Keene State College. He uh, told this person that he would be willing to meet. And I have not reviewed the logs, but I suspect that uh, he convinced this individual who was, again, wanting to hire someone for what sounds like an act of pornography, wants to record a sex act Which and, pay, legal in and New pay money for it. But the thing that's not legal in New Hampshire is to record a sex act, pay money for it, and not intend to distribute it. So, or not intend to sell it. And apparently, he admitted that the guy who was uh, wanting to hire the person to do the sex act, he admitted to the officer in some sort of a chat or over, you know, Craigslist chat or whatever it's called, messaging, that he would not be selling the video. So, basically, that's how they got him. Had he refused to say that he wouldn't sell the video or wouldn't even try, because it's, it's about your intention, apparently. Hmm. If it's your intention to sell the video of the sex act, then it's pornography. But if it's not your intention, if it's your intention to keep it for your personal collection, then it is a, uh, a, a hiring of a prostitute. And so uh, so that police officer, his full job description is to d- engage in deceit on a daily basis, wherein he pretends to be someone he is not, which of course is also the job of a drug uh, undercover officer, also pretending to be someone that they're not. So in many cases, officers from the, the start of their working day are telling lies for a living, not just getting convictions, but just from top to bottom. It's sick. Thanks, oh, yeah, and it, Go ahead. It's good you it's good you point that out because I remember the case now where they said the evidence was too much of a lie or too much deceit. It involves something like the police officer like pretended that he had the bloody glove that implicates you or like he actually constructed fake physical evidence. And that was uh, oh, the court, interesting. Uh, the, yeah. So the court and I don't have it. I don't have the citation, but I, I remember 
that that was well, the, that's that that's interesting to, to construct fake evidence would be a problem but to not tell someone or to apparently to tell someone that their buddies rolled over on them that's which, fake evidence that seems like fake evidence to me that's a common police tactic and it's it's widely accepted and utilized it's trained as a matter of fact so i wonder well, where they do, that, where they draw that that's line that's one part sorry go ahead i said i wonder where they draw that line is it only physical evidence that uh you know that the manufacturing that is that the is that the problem is that where they draw the line Apparently, it's it's really subjective. But yeah, that was the other thing that I'm not too sure about is that like actually being trained and told to lie. I mean, there are a lot of people who say this and, you know, you guys have your experience. And um, I mean, that might be true. It's just kind of hard to I mean, that's going to be really hard to prove to find, you know, a police like trainer who just says, you yes, think I so? train all my guys. I, I don't oh, know. I don't think it would be that hard to, to find that. We've had police trainer on the show in the past. We've had former oh, cops. Oh, he said that? I don't remember if he said that specifically, but we've had former cops on the program. It's it's fairly well known that the police are trained to lie. It's completely legal for them to lie in order to get convictions, in order to get you to reveal information to them. Thank you for the call tonight, Nathan. That's my understanding of it, at least. If anybody wants to disagree, feel free to call in and uh, share your thoughts at 855-450-FREE. Even if it wasn't um, part of the training, and I couldn't tell you whether it was or whether it is or not, um, it's probably it's part of the culture. Um, yeah. you Somebody know. <laughs> tells them at some point, hey, separate those two, and then tell them they both rolled over on one another and see what they say. It's clearly fraud, what they're doing, uh, sure. by, by lying, and then they call it a voluntary confession right. after after someone's been defrauded to believe something that's clearly not true. I, I It'd be think, fraud if you or I did it, but not when they do it. Well, it has a chilling effect, at least the case that you mentioned, on consensual sexual interactions, and, and who knows what else because of these threats by police. It's true. This guy got, uh, he paid the girl $150, or would have paid the girl, there never was a girl, I'm sorry, it was the, the cop. He he had agreed to pay her $150 to meet him in a the back seat of his car in a some fast food parking lot. I mean, what's wrong with that? It's his business and her business if she was real. Let's jump into it, Johnny Ray. We've uh, teased it. People have commented, but we haven't yet heard what Ron Paul has to say about this ISIS-Iraq troop increase. June 17th, 2014, by Ron Paul. Haven't we already done enough damage in Iraq? In 2006, I invited the late General Bill Odom to address my Thursday congressional luncheon group. General Odom, a former NSA director, called the Iraq War the greatest strategic disaster in American history Hmm. and told the surprised audience that he could not understand why Congress had not impeached the president for pushing this disaster on the United States. Wow. That Yeah, that doesn't really do it for me too much. I mean, he was around with Reagan and... I don't know. All the presidents should be impeached as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Well, this guy is claiming that this was the single greatest strategic error and that because of that, or I suppose because of something else, that he should have been impeached. I mean, he's taking a different stance than you and I might take. Uh, True enough. History continues to prove the general's assessment absolutely correct. In September 2002, arguing against a U.S. attack on Iraq, I said the following on the House floor. No credible evidence has been produced that Iraq has or is close to having nuclear weapons. No evidence exists to show that Iraq harbors al-Qaeda terrorists. Quite to the contrary, experts on this region recognize Hussein as an enemy of the al-Qaeda and a foe to Islamic fundamentalism. Unfortunately, Congress did not listen. Mm. As we know, last week, the second largest city in Iraq, Mosul, fell to the al-Qaeda allied Islamic state in Iraq and Syria. Here's what... This fascinates me. The largest city in Iraq, Mosul. Now, second tr- largest. Second largest. Second largest. Um, be the largest. Do you have a number on on that? Uh, give me some size kind of, of the city. No, I can pull it up. Yeah, I'm just trying to imagine something the size of, I don't know, Miami. Uh, that's the 11th radio market in the United States. I have some kind of clue as to how big this thing is. Um, I'm trying to imagine Miami. Three million people in Mosul. Mosul's bigger than Miami. <laughs> Um, it's as big as the Broward, uh, you know, the, the the whole Broward, Palm Beach, Dade area, I think, um, falling to 5,000 troops. 5,000 Were they armed- all there together or are they spread out, the 5,000? Are I they imagine- in different cities or are they all taking Mosul at once? 
uh, well, they've moved from city to city, so I I guess they must be leaving troops in place Mm -hmm. to some extent. I I, I would guess they're mostly coherent. That the the estimate that I got, I boosted a little bit. The estimate that I originally got was three to five thousand. Apparently, that estimate is a is a gross under estimate. Okay, so there's more. Yeah, because I just can't imagine that many people taking you know that taking that many. I just can't imagine it. Mm. Try try to imagine going around New York City and taking it with little two or five man squads, and how many of those you got a hundred of those? What? Mm. Well, Iraq is governed by uh, Shiites mostly. I think the the Western powers tried to when they reformed the country. I think they tried to get sort of a cultural mix, but mostly dominated by Shia. And Iraq and Mosul, the North Iraq, is Sunni. Uh, Shia Islam is mostly based in Iran and southern Iraq, and and most of the rest of of, of Islam is Sunni. Uh, Shia Islam represents about fifteen percent, so okay. they're 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 a real Iran, minority. But that's Iran and Iraq, and por- portions of Iraq basically is where the Shias, right? Yes. Yeah, and this is really sort of what it comes down to is is that there's. This is a long-running dispute uh, with the uh, Shias and the uh, Sunnis, and th- this is you know why I said on the show for years and years um, what they should have done with Iraq is split it up along uh, cultural lines into three countries and leave it alone. But George Bush said that he wasn't going to do that to Turkey in order to be able to run their bombers out of there. Uh, pursuant to that religious divide, the U.S. is considering bringing Iran in to help in Iraq. Very strange. Where they're very in talks. Bizarre. Strange bedfellows, huh? Well, yeah. Um, so U.S. allies are the ones that have funded this uh, these ISIS group. The you know the the U.S. citizens were told to support you know mentally or whatever this uh, this group in in um, Syria, but now. Um, we want to fight them in Iraq, and by teaming up with our old enemies, Iran. I just don't know. Is this the axis of evil? Because I'm not sure. When is Israel going to come in and drop bombs on everybody? Last week, an al-Qaeda that has not been in Iraq before our 2003 invasion threatened to move on the capital, Baghdad, after it easily overran tens of thousands of Iraqi military troops. The same foreign policy experts who lied us into the Iraq war are now telling us we must reinvade Iraq to <laughs> deal with the disaster caused by their invasion. Of course. They cannot it never, admit, it never ends. They cannot admit they were wrong about the invasion being a cakewalk that would pay for itself. So they accomplished. Yeah. They'll welcome us with flowers and so, open arms. So they want to blame last week's events on the 2011 U.S. withdrawal from Iraq. But the trouble started.